So whenever there is fracture of any bone in your body, right? So for example, this is the bone. Whenever there is fracture of any bone in your body, what is going to happen is that the two fragments of the bone are going to displace from each other. So this is a single bone. When it gets fractured, the fracture fragments, they get displaced from each other. So they displace away from each other. So when they displace away from each other, what is going to happen? There are some muscles that are attached above. There are some muscles that are attached below. So the muscles which are attached above are called as flexors or extensors based upon the upper limb and lower limb. And the muscles which are attached below are extensors or flexors. So when the fragments get displaced, each muscle which is attached to that fragment, it will perform its own action. So based upon the muscle contraction, it will pull the bone sometimes up, sometimes down or else the fragment can go laterally, the fragment can go medial, right? Because muscles are attached to the bones. So whenever this displacement of the fracture fragments, what can happen? What can happen is that these fracture fragments can either injure your blood vessels and cause a rupture of the blood vessels. That can be a complication. Second complication is these fracture fragments can injure your nerves and completely cause either wrist drop or fruit drop, right? So the nerve supply to the limb is gone. Third important thing is that these fracture fragments can pierce any tissue in your body, right? The sharp end of the fracture fragments can pierce the tissue and cause edematous swelling. So what we need to do when the fracture fragments are displaced, it is our goal to reduce the fracture fragment, to bring the fracture fragment back to the normal alignment. And once it is brought to the normal alignment, this process is called as reduction of the fracture. Once the fracture is reduced, now it is your job to tie out a some material so that the fracture remains in a standstill position or the fracture remains in a proper alignment. So when you are reducing the fracture, what is happening? When you are reducing the fracture, point number one, the entire bone aligns in a single line. There is a proper alignment of the bone. Second thing, when you are reducing the fracture, the injury to the vessels, the injury to the surrounding tissue is, is reduced. Third important thing is, when you are reducing the fracture, the muscle spasms are reduced. Right? So all these are done. So to achieve all of these, we need to reduce the fracture. And to reduce the fracture, two important things are very important. One is you need to give a proper traction. You need to pull the leg. If there is a fracture of the lower limb, you need to catch hold of the leg and pull it. You need to apply a proper force. For example, the fracture fragments are like this. If I am applying a proper force, the, the leg goes like this and finally it sits in a normal alignment. This is called as traction. And once the leg has been reduced, the fracture site has been reduced as a result of traction. Now you need to tie some material so that the entire joint or the entire fracture site becomes immobilized. So this material which you are using here is called as POP which stands for plaster of Paris. Now all of you know whenever there is a fracture we basically use plaster of Paris. Why do we use only plaster of Paris? Why can't we take simply a bandage and tie it hardly and immobilize the fracture? The reason is this plaster of Paris it becomes hard within few minutes, right? This plaster of Paris basically consists of calcium sulfate, okay? Hemihydrated calcium sulfate. So when this hemihydrated cal along with the starch, okay, along with the starch, hemihydrated calcium sulfate together forms the plaster of Paris. So when you are soaking the plaster of Paris in the water, or when you are adding this water to this calcium sulfate, whatever it is, right? This POP becomes hard and it emits heat and it loses water. Okay, so 80% of the water is lost from the POP and once the POP becomes dehydrated, it becomes hard by emitting heat. So this process is called as exothermic reaction. So we basically use these POPs. But two ways you can apply this POP guys. One way is either you can apply POP completely circular like this. For example, if there is a fracture of my radius and ulna, you can completely apply the POP like this. Second way is you can just apply the POP just beneath this, leaving the top surface free. Now, this process where, this method where you are applying the POP completely circularly, right, when you are enclosing 
in a complete circumference this is called as cast what is cast cast is nothing but application of pop in a complete circumference but if you are applying pop in a partial circumference partial circumference means only the only beneath or just above leaving the below surface empty or just below leaving the above surface empty so this is called as partial circumference or also called as slab so complete is cast half or partial or incomplete is slab when do you apply slab when do you apply cast for example if there is a simple fracture just a simple fracture or a hairline fracture for example let us say and this obviously hairline fractures are not displaced right so when there is just a hairline fracture let us say scaphoid fracture so in that case we apply cast but when there is a fracture which is displaced we apply slab why because we there is a risk that this fracture fragment the, the end of the fracture fragment the serrated ends of the fracture fragment will pierce the surrounding tissue leading to swelling so when there is a complete swelling here if you are applying cast then the swelling will not resolve so what you need to do you need to apply slab you need to apply a partial slab right when you apply slab leaving the top surface empty so the top surface is swollen so it will slowly by slowly the edematous fluid will leave away and the swelling will be reduced so that is the reason why you apply cast and you apply slab so today in this patient this patient is having fracture of the mid shaft of his tibia mid shaft of the leg exactly this region so this this type of fracture here is called as a both bone fracture why it is called both bone because all of you know here we have got two bones this is called as your tibia right laterally you have your fibula so when tibia and fibula both of them they break in the center this is called mid shaft fracture of the leg or both bone fracture of the leg where tibia and fibula both of them are broken in this case point number 1 is mid shaft fracture of leg point number 2 or this is the femur bone so these are the condyles just above the condyle if there is a fracture and here you have the knee joint all of you know here you have the knee joint this is called as these are called as a condyle just above the condyle this region is called as supracondylar region so if there is a fracture of supracondylar region or if there is a both bone fracture of the leg in these two cases you apply slab to the patient because in these two cases definitely there will be displacement of the fracture fragments and these fracture fragments they pierce the surrounding tissue leading to edematous fluid accumulation of edematous fluid so in such cases you need to apply slab obviously basically so in these two cases you apply slab now how do you apply slab how do you apply slab is that first of all before applying slab obviously you apply it with a pop so there are three steps step number 1 you first have to examine the leg of the patient step number 2 you need to apply the plaster of paris step number 3 is that you need to reduce the fracture so what is step number 1 you have to just examine the leg of the patient what do i mean by examination of the leg of the patient for example if the patient is having fracture at this mid shaft as i told you mid shaft of the leg you need to examine whether you need to examine the fracture site whether are there any lacerations here because if you don't if you don't examine the lacerations and directly without washing the wound or without suturing the wound if you are tying the slab then what might happen is that the patient would have severe infection unwashed wound will definitely end up having severe infection and that infection can go to the bone and cause osteomyelitis to the patient so for that reason you need to examine the fracture site you need to thoroughly examine the x ray of the patient why you have to fall uh, look at the x ray of the patient you know that there is a fracture here then why you need to look at the x ray because by looking at an x ray you will get to know which angle the fracture segment has been displaced for example if the fracture segment has been displaced like this so you pull the force you apply the force in that direction if the fracture fragment is displaced like this so you apply the force down so you have to know to to apply the force to apply the force to give the traction you have to know in which segment 
or which angle the fracture segment has been displaced. So for that reason thoroughly you need to watch the x-ray. This is called the examination part. Second thing, second thing is application of the plaster of Paris. Before applying plaster of Paris, always and always remember, don't directly apply plaster of Paris to the skin. If you directly apply plaster of Paris to the skin, I told you, once you apply plaster of Paris directly to the skin, plaster of Paris usually, what did I tell you? You soak it in the water and then apply it. After application, 80% of the water is lost. Only 20% of the water remains in the plaster of Paris. Then when 80% is lost, it will cause shrinkage. The plaster of Paris undergoes shrinkage when the water is lost. So when it undergoes shrinkage, it is attached to the skin. So it will undergo shrinkage. Even it will shrink the skin. It will compress the skin. So for that reason, and moreover, because of the allergy part, because of the dermatitis variant, because of all these things, never ever apply plaster of Paris directly to the skin. Then how to apply? How to apply is that before that you need to tie cotton to the patient. You need to tie something called a cotton roll to the patient. This, this method of tying cotton roll to the patient is called as padding. Now, whatever it is, whatever it is, how do I apply plaster of Paris or how do I tie the cotton pad? First of all, I have to take the measurements before applying plaster of Paris. This is not a cast. If it is a cast, I need not to take any measurements. I can just lift the leg up and start tying it. But this is a slab. So when it is a slab, I need to take a proper measurements. Now, how do I take a proper measurements? Slab should start from the distal end to the proximal end. Distal end in the sense, as you can see in the patient's leg, these are called as a tarsals. These are called as a metatarsals. So this is called as the base of the metatarsal. So from the base of the metatarsal, you need to start measuring the patient. So in this way, you, you measure the patient. From the base of the metatarsal, and this is called as a medial malleolus. So from here, all the way till medial malleolus, this is one. From the medial malleolus till here, this is two. And from here, all the way till here, this is three. And from here, all the way till here, this is four. So I have got a digit of four. Now, whenever I unroll the POP, obviously I have to put four digits here and measure the POP and take that particular length of the POP because that particular length of the POP is what fixes to the patient over here. Okay, so this is how you measure. Once again, so from here all the way, we start, actually we start on the lateral side. Okay, so let me show you on the lateral side. So this is one, this is two, this is three, and this is four, right? So here is the hip of the patient. So we basically take three and a half. Okay. So three and a half length of the POP. Okay. So this is one thing. I'll show you anyways how to measure the POP and all. So this is the basic measure which I can give you on the patient. Second important thing. When I'm tying the cotton, I mean when I'm padding the patient, right? The same thing. I'll start padding the patient from the base of the metatarsal. From here all the way I start padding the patient. How do I pad? In this way. I keep rotating the cotton pad in this way. I'll show you how I'll rotate. I'll keep rotating the cotton pad in this way. And if you have watched my previous video on how the leg traction has to be done, how the bandage has to be applied, the same rule applies here. The rule is that the second turn which you are doing, right, that should partially overlap the first one. So you have to cover 50% and then overlap it and go proximal. So now guys, let us see, let us see how after measuring, we have taken the number as four, right? Or three and a half, for example. So how do I put it on the POP and take the length of the POP? So this material is called as the plaster of Paris roll. Okay. Now, this plaster of Paris, as I already told you, it is made up of calcium sulfate and starch. And when we are adding water onto it, the calcium sulfate reacts with the water and finally it becomes hard. Okay. And it emits heat, obviously, then that reaction is called as exothermic reaction. So in our patient of a mid shaft fracture of the leg, I mean the both bone fracture of the leg, we have taken a count of four, right? We have taken the measurement of three and up to four. So how am I going to take the measurement of three and a half 
and and four almost four in this plaster of Paris. So first I have to unroll this plaster of Paris all the way, right? Now I take the measurement starting from here one. This is two. This is three, and this is four. Now exactly at this point I have to stop this here. I have to make a mark and then I have to unroll it for the next layer. So now I have formed two layers. Now the question is how many layers you have to overlap in this way? For the lower limb, for the lower limb, you need to overlap about. You need to take a count of about sixteen to twenty layers. Okay, but for the upper limb, you need to take a count of about twelve to sixteen layers. Okay, so for the lower limb, sixteen to twenty, and for the upper limb, twelve to sixteen. How many inches of POP we have to use? So this POP which I have taken, this is a six inch POP. So for the lower limb, we basically use six inch POP. But for the upper limb, we basically use four inch POP. Okay. So for the lower limb, we use six inch POP, and for the upper limb, we basically use four inch POP. And once again, for the lower limb, it is sixteen to twenty, sixteen to twenty layers, and for the upper limb, it will be fifteen to, it will be. 12 to 16 layers so this is the second layer now i have to make the third layer this is the third layer and this is the fourth layer so this is the last layer of pop so completely we have made 16 layers right so this 16 layer pop right so these are completely 16 layers these 16 layers we basically use for the lower limb as i told you we we take a count of between 16 to 20 So we have taken sixteen here for the demonstration, and for the upper limb we will be taking around twelve to sixteen. Now, after preparing the plaster of Paris, now we need to pad the patient. We need to do cotton padding from the base of the patient's metatarsal all the way till the mid part of the thigh. I mean, till the part which we have taken the count. Now we shall. I am showing you how to pad the patient. now we need to after preparing the layers right how many layers i told you 16 to 20 after preparing the layers of pop now we need to do cotton padding to the patient why padding is so important i have already told you you cannot directly apply pop to the skin if you are applying pop to the skin there will be irritation there will be dermatitis to the patient and moreover i told you pop becomes hard at the end how it is going to become hard it is going to become hard by losing water so when it loses water the pop will shrink as it is attached to the skin it will also make the skin to shrink right so for that reason you should never ever add pop directly to the skin you need to do cotton padding now how do i do cotton padding i already told you you have to do cotton cotton padding starting from all the way till the base of the metatarsals all the way till the mid mid shaft of the leg mid shaft of the thigh right So now, before doing cotton padding, one thing I want to make sure that you have to pad more near the bony prominences. What are the bony prominences? Look here, the calcaneus region. This is the bony prominence. The lateral malleolus, the medial malleolus. These are the bony prominences. For example, if you are padding for your upper limb, the the olecranon region. This is the bony prominence. Why are you padding more near the bony prominences? Because bony prominences. Have less fat or muscle, absolutely no fat or muscle. These bony prominences are just overlapped by the subcutaneous tissue and the skin. A little bit of subcutaneous tissue and the skin. And these bony prominences are most commonly exposed to the surfaces, right? So when when they are exposed to the surfaces repeatedly, there is a high chance of developing bed sores for the patient. So for that reason, near the bony prominences, you need to add more cotton. I mean, you need to pad more cotton. now how do i pat the patient starting from starting from the base here all the way and and keep in mind one thing you always have to start from the distal end to the proximal end okay so from the distal end now slowly i'm patting the patient this is how i need to pat so near the bony prominences i'm putting more cotton and now i'm patting the patient now how do you pat again the same rule the second roll have to be covering the 50% of the first roll it should cover 50% not the entire okay so i'm covering only the 50% of the first roll see now the this roll 
is covering just 50 percent not 100 percent okay just 50 percent like so in this way you need to pad it it should just again i'm telling you it should just cover the 50 percent Now after padding the layers, the skin should never be visible. So I can find some traces of skin here and here. It means these areas are not padded well. So I need to pad once, I need to pad them once again. So these areas, I'm padding them once again. Again the same rule, 50%, just cover 50%. So this is how we pad the patient. Now after padding, now you have to apply the POP, right? How do you apply the POP? As I have already shown you the layers which are formed. Now straight away, I need to take all these layers of POP with my hand into the water. I have to soak them in the water, okay? I will even tell you how to soak in the water and uh, till how much time you have to soak in the water. After that, you need to apply the POP. So before I directly apply the POV, let me tell you how am I going to apply it and then we'll demonstrate, right? So I have taken, just imagine there's POV in my hand. Now I have dipped in, I'm soaking it in the water. Now after soaking, I have removed it. The extra water I have removed it. Now all the way I bring the POV like this. I'll ask the healthcare worker to lift the patient's leg, right? Now I'll apply POP not on the top, but I'll apply POP on the ventral side. This is the dorsal side. This is the ventral side. And from where I have to start? I have to start from the distal end to the proximal end. The cotton padding also from the distal end to the proximal. So now what will I do? At the distal end near the base, again the same place near the base of the metatarsal, I will start applying the POP and all the way I'll apply it like this. All the way down till the mid of the thigh. Now, after applying here, I'll ask another healthcare worker to catch this, right, to withhold the POP down like this in a proper position. And now what I'll be doing is I'll be taking a roller bandage and I'll completely roll the patient. From where should I roll again? Not from proximal to distal, from distal to proximal. So this is the main plan which I'm going to do now. So I'll be showing you, I'll be demonstrating you how this is done basically. So now I have taken the 16 layered POP right now I am soaking it in the water now what is the one rule that you have to remember or how much time you have to soak this in the water the moment you put it in the water you have to make sure that the all the bubbles from this POP are out okay when no bubble is appearing only then you have to lift it up why because if there is some air that is left in the POP and if you have not removed it right the strength of the POP is reduced so to prevent the reduction of the strength of the POP, right, you need to soak it completely in the water so that the, all the bubbles go. So if the strength of the POP is reduced, what is going to happen? The layers will separate when you have added to the patient's leg, okay? So to prevent that separation of all the layers of POP, you have to remove, you have to make sure that the no air bubble is lying within the POP. So now I'm soaking it, you can see the air bubbles that are coming out. I hope you can see the air bubbles that have come out. Now, yes, now there is no air bubble that is coming out. It means all the air has left the POP. Now I'm slowly lifting this up. Now after lifting this up, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to remove the extra amount of water. Okay, in this way. Now don't remove too much so that the POP goes out. Don't remove it too much. So. Now I'm going to apply it to the patient. So now after soaking this POP enough, now I have to start applying the POP to the patient. I'll take the health care worker help and now what I'll be doing is I'll start applying POP from the base here. As you can see, I'm applying it from the base. So in this way, to the calcaneus down, right? Next, to the leg and I'll ask another health care worker to hold it. In this way. 
So after applying the POP, after applying the POP, now I need to apply the cotton bandage onto the patient, right? Or this is also called as a roller bandage. So how do I apply the roller bandage? Again the same thing. I have to start applying the roller bandage all the way from the distal end to the proximal end. Point number two is that you even have to soak this roller bandage so that no air bubble is left inside, right? So now I will be applying it. Now most of you think you can apply the bandage however you want. You cannot apply it in this way. Rather you have to turn it out and apply in this way. So like this. All the way. Apply it tightly. Now very important thing you need to know before applying this is that the same the same rule. The second layer which you are applying should cover 50% of the first layer. So in this way. And another thing is that do not tie too hardly. Why? Because if you are tying too hardly, all the tissues will undergo ischemia or it can also happen like this that there is a specific syndrome called as compartment syndrome. So all the nerves, all the vessels, all the muscles, they all gonna get compressed and patient leg will turn blue, ischemic and you have to later on amputate the patient's leg. So in this way, you need to completely tie the roller bandage. You have to start from the same place where you have ended it. Okay. You need to start from the same place where you have ended it. So in this way. Now the patient can feel, now I can feel personally the POP is getting hot. And always make sure that you don't find any cotton leaving outside. So in this way, as you can see the cotton here, you have to cover it up completely. Cotton is the main source for infection. Now we are putting on the last roll to the patient. Now after you have completely finished putting the roll till the distal part, I mean till the proximal part, again what did I tell you? You have to start from the place where you have ended it up. Why I am telling you this? Because I already told you in the starting always you have to start from the distal to the proximal. So in that way you might mistaken me that you have ended it here but if you start from here to here then there is no use. Now we are done rolling the cotton roll to the patient. Now after doing this, after doing this, what is the second important thing you need to do? Now this is the place where I have ended it up. I will make a small fold, overlap it. I have to put a patch on this so that this is not loosened, right? So I am taking the patch. So this is the POP patch which I have soaked it. I am putting the patch like this, right? Don't run this patch with your fingers, rather with your palm, any one direction because make sure all the holes here are disappearing. Why? Because if a single hole is left that will accumulate the air bubble and will cause separation of this patch. So in this way I am completely packing. Now after this, after this what you need to do? After this what you need to do is that you need to make sure, you need to make sure that the entire POP is properly set in the normal contours of the patient's leg. What do I mean by normal contours? You have to make sure there is no gap that is left in the center here. So you have to compress it like this. You have to make sure that there is no gap left near the calcaneus region. You have to compress it like this. You have to compress it. Right? You have to compress and make sure that the leg is properly fitting in the POP. In this way. And if there are any edges left, just send them inside in this way. Now, point number one, the first step was examination. The second step is applying the padding, I mean doing the padding and applying the POP. Now the third step is reduction. What do you mean by reduction? Reduction is, there is a fracture here. I have to give a traction and reduce the patient. So, what was the first step I told you? The first step is you have to examine the patient's leg. Right, whether there are any lacerations or not. If there are any lacerations, then just wash the wound, switch up the patient, 
apply the cotton pads and then apply the slab and also look at the x-row thoroughly step number two what you do is that you need to apply the padding right the cotton padding and plaster of paris and step number three is reduction so patient had a fracture here what i'll be doing is i'll be with my right hand i'll be hold, holding the dorsal surface of the patient like this and the next hand i'll be putting near the calcaneus region now i have to set this plaster of paris become before it becomes harder so i'm setting it like this now the plaster of paris is loose so i'm setting it after setting it now i have to pull and completely fall back in this way holding the patient's leg so that the bone fragments the broken part here the broken part here they both of them align in a same line okay so i have to withhold this for about three to nine minutes because it would take three to nine minutes for the plaster of paris to become semi hard right semi hard but for the plaster of paris to completely lose water and become fully stiff and hard it would take around 24 to 72 hours so for three to nine minutes the plaster of paris will become semi hard right this is called as setting of plaster of paris this is called as setting of plaster of paris the second thing in 24 to 72 hours the plaster of paris becomes super hard and that is called as hardening of plaster of paris so in this way i need to catch the patient and withhold so that the plaster of paris takes its normal position in this way after 3 to 6 minutes i need to leave the patient's leg now how do i leave the patient's leg first thing i have to this leg right now this leg right now is in an extension position i have to keep the patient's leg in a neutral position how do i keep the patient's leg in a neutral position i need to flex the knee right i need to flex the knee like this i need to flex the knee now after flexing the knee i put a pillow beneath okay for example my left hand such is a pillow i put put a pillow like this so that the extensor muscles of the thigh are not contracting the flexor muscles of the thigh are not contracting both of them are loose right when i when i leave the patient like this now the extensor muscles are tight they are contracting so what i need to do i need to flex them now the extensors and the flexors of the thigh are not contract even in the leg the muscles are not contract and even in the foot the muscles are not contracting so the entire leg is in a neutral position right now what did you achieve by this what i have achieved by this is that i am not moving the joint i have immobilized successfully immobilized the joint of the patient i have successfully immobilized the movement of the fracture fragments and i have successfully aligned the patient's fracture fragments in a single line the fracture site in a single line or the displaced fracture in a single line right so this is how you put a slab and this type of slab is called as above knee slab what do i mean by above knee slab guys above knee slab is the slab which is done till above the knee right like the mid shaft of the femur till the mid shaft of the femur which conditions do you put this above knee slab in those conditions where there is fracture of the distal femur where there is mid shaft fracture of the leg thank you for watching